it's working now. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. We are officially live on Make It So, Adventures in Spacecraft. Information is updated properly, and we are going to do some miniature painting. Uh, today, I'm going to be uh, painting a couple of the miniatures from the Demon Blades miniatures game uh, Rumble, in Ant in Rumble in Antarctica. I don't know why that's so hard for me to say. Uh, the miniatures uh, for this game are all based on the characters from Guar. Uh, the main thing I'm going to be focusing on is... Uh, painting this ring of fire that goes behind this really really cool figure um, I've already primed these uh, these minis uh, and I gave them uh, what's known as a zenithal uh, undercoat so I primed them in black and then I take my airbrush put white in and uh, what's up cage hanging out and stitching that's awesome um, so a zenithal undercoat is you know, prime it in black and then you hit it with white from the top down to sort of simulate the light as it falls over the miniature. Um, that helps in a, a couple of different ways. One, it sort of bakes in some of your light and shadows. And two, it helps you see a lot of the little detail. Um, you can see that this one's got all kinds of interesting details and, and things like that. Uh, um, so. Oof, frame rate's coming through real rough, ain't it? Um, give me just a second. I'm going to see if I can get that to be any better. Uh, let's see. All right, uh, well, hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, so in order to get started, uh, we're gonna be setting up a wet palette. Um, a wet palette is exactly like it sounds. Um, this is a uh, just a little Tupperware dish with uh, some folded up paper towel in the bottom. Um, I've already wetted the paper towel and I've got some parchment paper here, the same stuff that you'd use for baking cookies and stuff like that. Um, Sorry about the noise. Um, I'm just going to tear off a piece and put it back. And then we're just going to cut it to size to basically fit our area there. Um, and what this does, so we want it about this size. I'm going to go through and clean up the edges here. What this does is it allows the acrylic paint to last a lot longer. It doesn't turn dry instantly. Uh, um, and allows for much smoother blending and better color mixing and uh, just overall makes it last a lot longer. Uh, so you can put just a little bit of paint down on here um, and even if you're done for a while you can just toss the lid back on, come back a few hours later and it'll still be good to go. And I've had paint last multiple days on a, on a wet palette uh, that's still fresh enough to use. Um, sometimes it'll actually get a little too thin, um, so you may want to just, if that's the case, you just leave the lid off for a little while, and then it'll start thickening back up. All right, so now we've got probably the worst piece of parchment paper I've ever cut. Um, I'm just going to set that in there and just kind of rub it a little bit to help some of the, help it make contact and stay nice and in contact with with the base. One of the things I like about using this little Tupperware dish is it has a slightly raised center. So I can use a little droplet and use my uh, my cherry jar I've been using for my painting reservoir for years. Um, just use a pipette and add a little bit of a few drops of clean or clean enough water around the edges that I'll be able to pull from as I need. Like I said, since we're going to be painting primarily a ring of fire, that uh, fire's a really tricky thing to paint. Um, actually, I've got an example a project I was working on to sort of teach myself the basics of it that I can show you here. Um, the trick with painting fire is that you 
it actually kind of works exactly the opposite of how other uh, miniature painting tends to work where with fire with really hot things or things that are exuding lots of light or emanating lots of light you actually want the brightest bits to be down in the recesses and then it get darker and cooler the further up it goes um, I painted this as a test to teach myself a little bit more about painting fire uh, uh, before starting this project this project is a commission and I wanted to make sure that I got it uh, right the first time uh, when actually working for it or, or, or on somebody else's stuff so that's the effect that we're going to be going for this is the ring of fire itself I've got it um, in a little clamp here so that I'm not manhandling it with my big stupid clumsy fingers um, and I gave it a similar sort of zenithal coat um, but but tried to focus more on getting a nice clean white base because it, you actually want it to be as bright as possible um, as a start. A lot of times for minis I'll start with black and keep it fairly muted because if you use a white base coat the colors can come off a little bit cartoony, a little bit too bright. Um, so we're gonna set up our, our wet palette now. Um, I'm gonna So I've got my spectrum of colors that I'm gonna be using for this section. I've got, uh, this is Formula p 3 Scarn Red an old, old, old bottle of Games Workshop's Blood Red. Uh, game Colors, uh, I think this is Vallejo Game Color. Yeah, uh, uh, Orange Fire, uh, Citadel, a newer Citadel, uh, Flash Gets Yellow, and then uh, Citadel's uh, White Scar layer paint uh, that basically I'll be working my way uh, this way down the, the spectrum on there. So I'm gonna get some of those down on my palette here. I've got some additional colors here for painting the uh, uh, the additional bits. Um, the, the statue or the Kali figurine itself. So I'm just applying a little bit of paint onto my palette, cleaning the brush paint goes aside and the yellow um, I mentioned this on a previous uh, stream but uh, one of the tricks I use to make my paints a little bit easier to use is uh, actually I've got a bunch of them right here uh, I take uh, these little hematite beads just like that uh, and toss them into my paints. Uh, hematite's great because it doesn't uh, oxidize or corrode. I used to use uh, copper BBs or steel BBs, uh, but they would oxidize and actually start tinting the color of the paint. Um, but putting two of those in each of my uh, paints, anytime I get a new paint, uh, it acts as an agitator and anytime you shake up the paint, it just helps shake it up just like the marble in a uh, can of spray paint. Um, All right, so a little bit of the orange fire from Vallejo. We'll get it set up. And it's a bit thicker, but that's all right. I'd rather have it thick with a lot of pigment than too thin. Move these scissors out of the way. Some of this red flash gets red, or blood red, which is one of my absolute favorite colors. It's such a just the bold, really elemental red. Yeah, Cage, okay, exactly. It's just like a spray can. Um, but the it was a trick I learned from, I think, Black Magic Craft, and a really cool, uh, great uh, channel on YouTube. They, uh, oh, come on, this paint pot is always a pain in the butt to open. I used to have a little tab on it that broke off years ago. Um, you may also notice on a lot of my <clears throat> on a lot of my paints, uh, I have at least a little dab of the paint on top. Just makes it easier to tell exactly what color you can expect to get out of it um, once it's dried. Um, and I try to make it a little bit, you know, uh, fade off when I paint it. Come on, I cannot get this lid open. There it goes. Come on. Um, so that you can kind of see how transparent it is too. It makes for a good test. All right, and then this Scarn Red. I'm going to be very careful with this Scarn Red because it's, 
kind of got a, a cooler, almost purple tint to it. Um, and I'm not going to use a ton of it when I'm blending. All right. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit of black to the palette as well. Um, especially as it gets further and further up, uh, you sort of want to show more and more of it like turning into this smoke and the, the higher level of contrast you can get, the hotter the flame begins to appear, as you can see on this guy. All right. So let's get a little bit of black. This is another uh, Thamar black. Man, model paints always have the goofiest names. Uh, that's another one from P3 that I've had for ages. Just get a little bit from the lid. Is that going to be enough? No, I didn't shake this up enough, did I? I'm going to set that there. And I like to try to keep my colors in that sort of spectrum order on my palette that I can pull from. This makes it a lot easier for blending. Cage says, it's been so long since I've done anything with paints, having a bit of flashbacks to undergrad. What'd you study? Were you taking art classes? I went through uh, DigiPen and uh, took a lot of art classes just across the disciplines. Um, it was a lot of fun. I actually really enjoyed going back to school. All right, so I'm going to start with the yellow and actually add a little bit of the white to it because I want this to be a really, really bright base coat. And I'm not going to thin this out too much because I want it to, to be pretty heavy coat. And then I'm going to work my way up as I go. Um, and this is going to take, almost definitely going to take two thin coats of this color. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Oof. I took graphic design. I took a bunch of studio arts. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, with the animation classes I was taking, we had to take a lot of different types of art classes. Um, that's one of the things about animation is you kind of have to know a little bit about everything. But really, the foundation of animation is being able to draw and you know understanding the basics of figure and physics and uh, things like that as well as you know just having a good understanding of composition but we also got to do a lot of like, uh, experimenting with acrylic and oil painting and lots and lots and lots and lots of life drawing uh, learning about perspective and all of that fun stuff and then finally got to start working with computers and things like that this after the, the first year was sort of graduating your way up into 3d modeling and learning 3d animation um, one of my favorite lessons out of that uh, that they really tried to drill home was that regardless of the tools you're using whether it's you know a notebook and pencil or a uh, a canvas or a computer and things that you're rendering um, you know no matter how 3d the subject is unless you're working in sculpture the end result is always a 2d image you know it when you're in animation that might be 24 2d images a second but it's very easy to fall in love with the 3d nature of working in 3D animation or in 3D modeling, but really at the end of the day, it's all about what appears on the screen and you can't render anything on a screen that's not a 2D image. So learning how to take that into account in your design was super important as you're blocking stuff out, making sure that you're thinking about silhouette and readability in a 2D blocking. Um, and then translating that into games where you may not necessarily have full control over the camera placement. You have to think about all kinds of ways to 
sort of cheat the silhouette to uh, maximize readability from any angle or from the most likely angles so that everything stays readable at all times and communicates the information that you're really trying to convey. All right, so we got our first base coat down. We're gonna give that a second to just kind of dry. We'll be getting into some wet, wet blending here shortly. Make sure I got all the little nooks and crannies. This is something I like to do when working on stuff is if I need to give it some time to dry, make sure that I'm working on multiple uh, mini so I can let one dry and then move to the next one. Um, so for this mini, this is up a little bit high. Um, so real quick detail, uh, I only have one of these sort of clamp bases and they're great, but it's kind of a lot of money. I mean, it's like 10, 20 bucks for something that's not hard to make. Um, all over my desk, you'll probably frequently see I've got a lot of these old pill bottles um, and I use old corks and old paint pots and stuff like that. These work perfectly for just handles to hold onto. Um, I just add, like this one's got a little bit of gravel in it. Some of them will have some nickels or some of those beads or so that one over there's got paper clips. Just something to add some weight to it to help, you know, so that it doesn't get top heavy once you add a metal miniature to the top of it and just give it a little more heft in your hand. Um, but this allows you to get in and sort of work your way around the mini without getting your fingers all over it uh, and ruining your paint job in the process. Um, this one, I'm gonna go with kind of a blue cast skin tone here. So I'm gonna actually go in with a bit of a darker base color. Um, I'm probably gonna blend between, I've got two uh, base colors here. This is the Fang from Citadel and uh, Damonette Hide, which is appropriate. Um, it's a bit more of a purplish tone and this is more, a little bit more bluish. So um, I'm gonna make sure those are sh shaken up, add them to the wet palette, and then we'll use that as our base color um, as we go. Go. Uh, at what point do I paint the parts in the clip? Um, that's a great question. Um, so that is actually going to be hidden pretty well behind the the mini. Um, I'll probably let this dry and add a little bit of base coat, but I'm probably going to save most of that for last. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see it very much. Uh, um, uh, so I, I'm not too worried about being able to uh, to paint that and, and get the blend 100% perfect, um, but uh, yeah. Um, and then do I just wait for one layer to dry and then do that part? Um, um, like I said, I'm, I'm actually just going to leave this basically as is for most of the time that I'm painting it, um, and then I'll finish off that part later. Um, a lot of the painting I'm going to be doing, I'm actually not going to be waiting for it to dry. Um, I just want to make sure that my first base coat goes on as smooth as possible. Um, you can, I don't know how well it comes through on camera, uh, but you can see that you know, some of the darker color, it's just not giving a nice smooth yellow uh, on there. Yellow is actually one of the hardest colors to base coat um, to get a smooth uh, layer in. Um, for whatever reason, it just it's very hard to find a fully opaque yellow paint uh, that still looks good. So um, I'll wait for it to dry, give it a second coat. All right, um, and then once that's on, then we can start doing wet blending where we're not actually waiting for it to dry. We're actually using the fact that it takes a little while for it to dry uh, to our advantage to get smoother transitions. Um, and then we'll actually come back and uh, as we work it lighter to darker, uh, we'll actually come back later and add more of the brighter yellows and whites into the little recesses to make it really pop out and, and look good. Um, so I, oh, that's a little too wet. I'm gonna pull a little bit of this, the fang, the blue color, mix in some of this kind of purplish tone. I actually kind of like that purplish tone a little bit better. So I'm gonna 
air a little bit more on that side. Um, and actually, I'm going to add a little bit of this uh, game color. It's dark blue. It's almost it says dark blue, but it's much more of a purple tone. But I want my base tone to be a little bit darker than what I'm seeing here. Um, I, in general, I like to work dark uh, as my base and then work my way into uh, brighter tones. Um, and I'm going to go with really kind of warm purple as, as my base and then work towards cooler blue colors in my highlights and that should contrast really well with the nice bright warm colors of the flame. Um, and then I'm going to be using, uh, similar to what I did in the ice bases, uh, the same sort of blending technique uh, that I'm using for the flame um, on her eyes and in a few other spots uh, to really help them pop out and make it feel just super energetic. Um, so I'm just going to go over this with one thinned coat um, and that's going to, the thinned coat, one it goes on smooth and it doesn't obscure any of the fine details Make sure you get it down into all the recesses. It's okay to paint over some of the finer things that aren't necessarily going to be skin tone at first because we're going to be going back and picking those off with new base colors later. Um, but yeah, the thinned version one, it doesn't uh, obscure any of the real fine details. And two, it allows you to, uh, or allows that zenithal undercoat that we did to come through just a little bit you don't see a lot of it. Um, but it helps sort of bake in our shadows just a touch. But more than anything, I've found that Zenithal is great. It works a lot better if you're using glazes, like really thinned paints. But uh, more than anything, personally, I just find that it helps me see a lot of the details that I might otherwise miss when I'm planning out my colors on the, the mini. All right, so we're painting the hand on this sacrificial knife. I've got lots of these little bits where she's wearing two of these big, thick bracelets that are going to be a bit of a problem later. We'll have to make sure that we paint those La or the bracelets themselves last so that we can because we are definitely going to be slopping skin tone paints and things like that on the bracelets there's just I don't see a good way to avoid doing that um, and I'm using a pretty big brush with a generous amount of paint on it uh, for a couple of reasons uh, one the base coat it's not critical that it's super super precise. I'm going to go through and add the other colors later. Uh, two larger brushes hold a lot more paint so I don't have to keep going back to the same well and I don't have to keep remixing more and more of the color um, and it allows it the paint job to be a little more consistent. Uh, so this hand right here is actually where the uh, Goblet of Blood uh, will be attached. Uh, the Goblet of Blood was one of the accessories that we set up a mold uh, for on a previous episode of Make It So. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, Cage is, is saying, yeah, on a project like this it's beneficial for it to not dry super fast so that you can, you can do more blending. And that's true. Uh, uh, but a lot of the blending that we're going to be doing is uh, will be over dried paint. We'll be using very thinned paints to get uh, some of those effects, kind of glazes, and get some of the more subtle effects. Especially since this is a commission, I want to make sure that I'm giving it, giving it my all. Um, I'm just going to do a full coat of purple over the face. And again, we're going to come back and detail a lot more of this later. But I just want to get a decent base coat. You can see it. I don't know how much it's going to come through on the camera, but you can see a little bit of the zenithal coming up here. I'm also going to try to keep the darkest colors lower and 
and focus the brighter colors up high and that contrast helps sort of lead the eye up and it sort of replicates the effect of light and shadow and light falling over this mini. It's got a bunch of cool little props that are going to be fun to paint. We've got a little torch in this hand that we're painting now. There's a severed head, a rose, and a sacrificial dagger. We've got the torch, a noose, and then a goblet of blood, and then this big ring of fire that goes behind her. And I'll show you where that goes here in just a second. doing this sort of six-armed Kali goddess version of Slymenstra from Guar. Because why not? We're War games are metal already. Let's lean into it. This is a very, very, very hard to find, very rare mini that I am unbelievably fortunate to have come across a guy with a full collection of them that was willing and able to commission me to paint them for him. Super cool. All right. Cool. So that base coat on that is done and we're just going to leave that to dry. And most of our yellow is done. It's still a little bit wet in some of the recesses, but that's okay. That's where the most paint is already at. We're going to pull a little bit more of the yellow over. You can kind of see how I'm blending the stuff here. I'm just pulling a little bit hit in here, and then I'm pulling a little bit of the white, and we're just mixing it like so. And that damp uh, parchment paper allows this stuff to last a really long time. If I was just doing this on a regular... Uh, regular palette, uh, those paints would already be starting to dry. All right, so I'm just going to go in and do one more coat of the yellow. And we're going to switch to a slightly smaller brush and start working our way up the, the spectrum here. piece of dried paint mixed in. We'll just get rid of that onto the paper towel. Cool, that side's done. We'll do one more here. I'm really trying to lean more into the that bolder yellow. We'll come back in with more of the white later that we're dropping into the, the little recesses. Really just trying to start with this yellow to give it a strong base tone because that's going to be what we're deriving all the rest of our colors from. Get a little bit thick so we just pull a tiny bit of water from one of the drops that we set up in on the wet palette. I like to control the consistency of my paint by just dabbing it onto the paper towel that I always put down. And it sort of shows me the consistency of the paint. Um, you'll see a lot of mini painters will do paints on their thumbnail. Um, I don't for whatever reason. Yeah, with, like if I was using oil paints, I'd have a lot more time to work here, but since we're working with acrylics, you do have to work fairly quickly. All right, so now we've got that base coat in. Um, I'm gonna clean this brush. And then I'm going to switch to a slightly smaller brush. Uh, not this guy, not that guy, this guy. 
Yeah, so this is a uh, Winsor Newton Series 7. That's a size 1 brush. I typically don't like to go too much smaller than this, especially if I'm doing large areas. Uh, the most important thing is that I've got a nice sharp tip to it, um, and having a, a bit of a larger brush like this gives me a little more control over the paint. I've got a lot more paint to work with, so I'm just going to dab into the orange and start mixing in some of the yellow here. Um, and I'm going to do this fairly thin, but we're going to do this color blending pretty slow. Um, I'm just going to kind of start at some of the the tips, sort of work my way down, and the wet yellow is going to help this blend nice and smoothly. Uh, but having a nice large brush like this with a fine tip should store plenty of the paint so I don't have to keep going back to my palette over and over and over and over again. Um, you know what, let's just go ahead and mix up some more of this. Add a little bit of water, add a little bit of yellow, add a little more yellow, a little more water. We don't want this to be quite a glaze. We want it to stay fairly transparent, but we definitely want to be staining our colors here. Um, and we're going to go pretty broad. We're not going to try to control too tightly with this pass. Um, and I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit, try to find some of these. Um, the main thing is I'm, I'm trying to avoid getting in the deepest recesses, because those are the areas that we want to stay uh, a brighter yellow color. Um, and to do that, I'll typically pull away from that area. Um, when you're pulling away and collecting your strokes in, in one area, it'll tend to make the paint accumulate wherever you're ending up, so you get smoother blends and transitions uh, in the areas that you're pulling away from and more opaque in the areas that your brush lands at. Um, for these big, more exposed areas, like that. Oh, this is tricky to do for a camera. All right, so here, these raised areas are definitely going to want to be a lot darker, because this is a flame cools as it gets away from the center. So we're basically just going to start working our way around the top, and the top itself is going to be mostly darker colors, and actually some of this will actually get pulled all the way to black. Um, I'm going to want the hottest areas along the base, make it look like it's, you know, the heat is, or the whole, the flames are sort of cooling as they rise around the ring. Do, 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 do. Yeah, so I don't think that we're going to get a whole lot of yellow this high up at that point. So it's okay to just go ahead and basically do another base coat over that yellow. But that yellow is already giving us a nice bold starting color so that we don't have to worry about it, the opacity of our oranges and stuff nearly as much. Got a little more water. We'll work our way around this side. So this is going to be yeah, this is the side that we're painting right now is actually the side that will be facing towards the viewer most of the time, unless they're looking at the back of the mini. Um, this may be actually a little bit too thin for down here, because it's starting to pool up in the areas I don't want it to. There we go. Like I said, we'll come back and fix some of the little problems and stuff like that. We're just trying to get our bases in first, and then we can do our really more interesting blending once we get this stuff on. Let's see. How's that look on camera? Is that, is that showing up at all? Can you see any of the orange versus the yellow? It's pretty hard. It's a pretty subtle distinction. I'm not sure that the warmness of these lights is really helping 
that come through. I got a feeling some of it's getting kind of white balanced out too. It'll be more evident once we start getting some of the other colors in and start building up contrast. Here we go. Cool. And actually, for demo purposes, I think I'm probably going to skip doing the back for a little bit. Um, and I'm going to work all the way to orange and actually start working in a little bit of the red already. Um, just so I can start making some bold choices. Um, let's kind of lay down our landmarks. And then uh, we can kind of work our way towards them. So we've got this big spike right here. That's going to be the first one that we start pulling up to red. Um, and this is really thin down, so we're going to use that same technique of just sort of pulling, like so, um, and letting that blend so that it's the boldest at the very tip. Um, this is going to be another sort of raised area where it's going to be pulling a lot more towards the red. This raised bit right here that sort of wraps around is definitely going to get more of the red. So, so yeah, now is when it's, we start getting a lot more careful with our color placement. And we've still got a lot more contrast to work through. So we can still be fairly bold with this stuff. Um, and we'll be able to kind of go back and do that sort of push and pull of contrast and color. So we put new color or brighter colors back down into the recesses and get our blends exactly how we want them but right now we're just sort of laying in the <clears throat> the foundation for all of this stuff and kind of discovering what our actual paint is going to look like Got a nice little line there it's one of the things i like about minis is you know obviously i didn't sculpt this and the more detail you start putting in, the more detail you start discovering, the more careful you get with it, you start learning more about the Mini and it sort of teaches you a little bit about what it wants to do. So you get faced with all these little opportunities, and little dilemmas and uh, times where you can make creative decisions and, and things like that along the way that you may not have, or you know, most of the time, definitely didn't uh, account for in your original planning when you were first sort of thinking about the mini. There we go. That's starting to come through. We'll keep doing that all the way around. Add a little more red. We're going to do a little bit of that along the bottom here. And same thing along the other side. Another nice thing about having a large base like this is it helps steady your, or like the clamps that I'm using. It really helps steady my hand. I can just basically wedge it onto the table and kind of press down. And I find that that helps reduce the shakiness of my hand. Um, and then I can use the other part to set my hand on and, oof, that's too dark, especially for this low. Um, and get much more precision with my brush. All right, let me get a little more of this yellow coming in a little bit too bright, a little bit too red this early on. There we go, mixing a little more of that orange. I want this bottom part to be brighter than it is at the top. Maybe I'll work back up to the top. Well, no, let's, let's keep at it. It's one of the things I like about just art in general is really a lot of art is just problem solving of you know the hard part's the idea well, sometimes the easy part's the idea but so much of art is just in the making and in the execution that uh, 
takes a lot of concentration and patience to pull things off and most of the time you're discovering things along the way that new problems you hadn't encountered or just surprises in general and a lot of that process comes down to just problem solving you know like, okay how do I make this look the way that I want it to um, oh I didn't think about this little bit okay how do we do that without ruining this bit and stuff I enjoy that aspect of it quite a bit because I'm a huge nerd as a matter of fact speaking of problem solving and being a huge nerd uh, one of our designers recently shared a video on our company uh, slack channel of this guy solving sudoku puzzles uh, and he's like a world champion sudoku guy but he's at this he's got a British accent I don't know if he's uh, actually living in the UK or uh, if that's just where that's his country of origin or, or what but uh, he is just the most charming dude and is so enamored by the problem solving process and the sort of discoveries of logic that come with uh, solving these Sudoku puzzles it's kind of become my go-to videos for when I need to just kind of relax and fall asleep it's very sort of ASMR-esque without the weird creepiness that comes with ASMR at least I find some of that ASMR a little bit creepy um, I don't mean to cast judgment it's that's your jam but I am not one for having somebody all up in my business and I find that most ASMR is all about having somebody a little bit too close to you and that freaks me right out all right cool so that is already starting to look more like fire it's obviously way overdone um, and way you know, too high of contrast, uh, but we'll go back in and, and smooth out some of this later and actually add a little bit of white and yellow down down into the, the hottest areas. But we're gonna start taking this, pushing it more towards red and towards the top and the tips, actually pushing it all the way to black. Uh, so let's take some of this red, and pull in just a little bit of the orange. We're gonna start working our way towards these darker colors now. And we'll do the same thing on the other side here in a little bit. All right, so let's start with the tips since that's going to be the highest areas of contrast. And darkness. All right, so just carefully you know, planting our palm. Just using our fingers to manipulate this. There we go. Nice, 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 nice. Cool. Yeah, so let's get this some really nice, bold red color on some of those tips. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit down here. Same over here, try to keep a little bit of the symmetry going. It's cool, so uh, the character this is for, Slymenstra, um, I've got to see Guar three times. Uh, the first time I saw them was at, was at this tiny, tiny, tiny little rock club in Seattle called the Rock Candy. It was a place I used to go see all kinds of punk rock shows and stuff like that when I was a hoodlum. Um, and Guar, for those that aren't already familiar, is a shock rock metal band that dresses up like these over-sexualized uh, intergalactic barbarians from space, from the planet Scumdogia, and plays goofy, dumb, heavy metal. Um, 
heavy metal is inherently kind of dumb and I say that with the highest possible regard it's dumb the way monster trucks and professional wrestling are dumb and that yeah it's obviously it's fake these are not real barbarians from the planet Scumdogia but that's kind of the beauty of it it's it's taking some of this aggression and uh you know the silliness of violence and slapstick and all of that stuff and just cranking it up that's a, a lot of my favorite metal bands have always been slightly tongue in cheek and uh, you know a little bit self aware of how goofy a lot of that stuff is red fang is a great example of sort of embracing the the fun and goofiness of heavy metal um anyway the character that i'm painting this for slimenstra uh <laughs> uh rage says uh the only guar songs i owned were on the family values tour cd i remember that cd um uh so slimenstra would actually come out and uh breathe fire over the crowd um, and in a tiny little crowd like this, that was awesome. Uh, a big part of their act is uh, they'll bring out, you know, celebrity or other characters, uh, obviously at, you know, these big rubber fake versions of these celebrities, um, and then chop off their heads with these huge giant swords and spray fake blood all over the audience and stuff like that or toss them into the giant meat grinder and just gallons of this fake blood will go spraying out over the audience and it's it's basically just tinted water uh which is actually kind of nice in a super hot uh uh rock show where everything is sweltering and there's no air at all um but this tiny little rock club had uh, plastic hung up all over the place just to sort of protect the walls and things like that from all the water that was going to be sprayed um, and the crowd was just soaking wet when she came out started spinning fire and then boom, started blowing these huge fireballs all, all over the crowd and you could see the plastic start to crinkle a little bit and everybody was kind of steaming it was, yeah it was a great show it's, it was actually, I think, my 18th birthday. My older brother got me tickets to see Guar and a copy of Primus's Brown album, which is still one of my favorite albums of all time, which, Eric, if you're out there, one of the best birthday presents I've ever received in my life. All right, so we've got this pretty well blended um, all the way from our yellows to our darkest reds. Um, so I'm going to start mixing in black and just start really working our way toward the darkest colors here um, and in wet blending I'm trying to work as quickly as I can so that it doesn't ever get fully dry um, and it makes the blending a lot easier I'm not doing a great job of it at the moment but it's good enough uh, um, usually wet blending you tend to do uh, a lot more on larger smooth areas to get really smooth grand uh, transitions and things like that like uh, jackets and coats and cloaks and capes and things like that it was an awesome birthday it was a that was a, a phenomenal time that was the first time i got to see guar um, we actually had parked our cars in the parking lot right across from the club and their tour bus pulled up and basically parked right in front of our car so we got to just sit there and watch these guys you know out of makeup uh coming in you know uh, getting off their bus and we were geeking out because back then they were my all-time favorite band I used to listen to it I had a copy of their scum dogs of the universe album uh, on tape on cassette that I would listen to and on the other side of the cassette was the dead Kennedy's uh, plastic surgery disasters I think yeah uh, that was basically the soundtrack of my senior year of high school uh anytime i would get in the car that was my go-to cassette to toss in i am absolutely aging myself as i'm talking about all this stuff all right so we're 
working our way to these real darker colors. I'm using some of this almost purplish red here and mixing in some of the black and it really gives us a, a much more purple tone and I want to avoid using too much of that because I don't want it to look purple. I want it to actually go all the way to black and kind of look like it's starting to turn to smoke. All right, I'm going to have to hold this steady. Um, so I'm basically just using the edge of the brush instead of the tip at this point to try to just hit the highest points of the of the model itself and let it sort of take the paint for me. Oh, this is real tricky. So forgive me if I get a little quiet. I tend to hold my breath as I'm doing some of these more subtle details. Alright, I'm gonna hold this steady, rest it on my finger so I can do the same trick where I'm just running the edge along here and just kind of stippling. I'm really trying to push that contrast. It's okay to, on the tips here, I can go nice and dark. Get a little more paint, get a tiny bit of water, a little more black. That's looking good. Okay, so let's wrap that around. This has got this kind of funny twist to the way it's sculpted. And it's tricky to get the brush to follow the edge. All right. Uh, and with mini painting in general, a lot of times you're actually like if I was trying to do this on a bust or something much larger, I wouldn't go for quite this super high contrast. But since it's something so small that's intended to be viewed from at least like three feet away, you really want to push some of these details to make sure that stuff is is readable, um, that it actually shows up. Because otherwise, they, if you if you're too subtle with minis, a lot of that detail gets lost. And I'm certainly not a super, super pro level painter or anything like that, but I've been doing this a long time. I've gotten pretty decent, I like to think. All right. This little tiny vice. This is actually a Citadel brand. Uh, Games Workshop makes these. Um, the nice part about this is these jaws actually open up too and you can clamp in round or square bases uh, into those too um, and then they've got these removable little uh, arms that work really well for holding these other little fine details nice and firm all right so we're getting some of these other raised tips some raised bits here a little bit right there I'm trying to avoid getting too much of the really dark underneath because again we want the want it to feel like the heat is rising and that it's cooling as it rises. So the hotter colors will stay lower. There we go. And we're just kind of working our way into this kind of darker purple, and then we'll come back with the black and just do a tiny bit of edge lining. Oof, that's not blending super well. I'm gonna flip that over so I can pull towards me. off some of that. We need a little more water. Make this slightly more transparent. Nice. Good. Okay, so now we're going to hit this part again. I've kind of got a broken line there I want to repair. Nice little detail there that I'd missed. Kind of dabbing, working my way down. Work my way down. Just getting the tips of these guys. It's 
especially on the interior. Again, we're just sort of pulling towards the tip, <coughs> so it'll get more and more opaque as it gets closer to the tip. Then we're going to come back with black and finish it off, and then we're going to kind of let that dry. And most of it's pretty dry. We're going on pretty thin coats, and it's not getting an opportunity to really pool up. Um, and then we'll come back in and start adding in uh, yellows and whites to really smooth out some of our transitions here. All right, so let's get basically going to f nearly full black. I don't want to go to 100% black because that's such a flattening color. Um, and this, I actually want it to be f fairly dry on the brush because um, I'm just going to go in and just skip it around the edges. I only want it to show up in some of the along the edges here. Really help these shapes read. Pulling away, pulling away. And basically, again, this is exactly the opposite of what I would normally be doing. I'd be painting all the raised bits in the brightest colors to show that how they're catching the light on most minis. So this technique took me a while to sort of unlearn a lot of the techniques I've been using a lot in the past. Um, I'm actually blend that away. I don't like that there. Um, like we did with the <laughs> big tiny what's up that's my my younger brother hanging out uh yeah we should get a little tiny motorcycle jumping through it it's a little mo mouse riding it named ralph <laughs> awesome but yeah so this is really starting to come together and you can see how much of the contrast really reads, even when it isn't particularly well focused. Uh, but that's because I'm using webcams with autofocus to try to shoot something that's about an inch and a half high. All right. I think that's at least for now, going to do it for the black. Well, actually, hold on, I lied. I'm going to add a little tiny touch here, and a little tiny touch there. I think this does need a little bit of black right there, too. Just knock that in. Nice and subtle. Really helps out line read. There we go. All right, now I really want to make sure my brush is nice and clean. Got to do the Bob Ross, and beat the devil out of it. Um, and actually, where is my brush cleaner? There it is. This stuff I am a big fan of. I've had this for a couple of years. This is uh, original B&J specially prepared, the Masters Brush Cleaner and Preserver. Um, it's basically just a brush soap. Um, you get your brush nice and wet. It also ends up having I've had it so long that these little lumps have started to develop in here, which is actually kind of great um, because it acts as a kind of a little bump I can scour the brush over. And I'm going to get all the paint that was trapped inside it all the way down. Um, do it. So, uh, good news is asking is there anything uh, I do to preserve the paint? Uh, when I'm finished, like a matte coat or anything um, that you normally do in Gunpla? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got um, basically a, uh, a satin finish or a fully matte finish uh, uh, sealant that I'll put over it, especially f uh, for minis that are going to see a lot of table play. I'll put multiple coats over it. Um, and back in the day when I used to smoke cigarettes, uh, which is a terrible habit that nobody should do, um, one of the tricks I would do is actually blow cigarette smoke over it uh, while it was still wet with the um, matte uh, the matte sealant still wet on it and that would actually help push it even more matte so you you lose a lot more of the uh, <coughs> of the potential shine and it looks a lot better 
Uh, nowadays I don't smoke cigarettes and haven't in a couple of years, which is good, uh, but um, I don't have a way to replicate that trick anymore. So, oh well. Um, eh, you didn't notice the smell. It's like, it was just enough to help seal it. Uh, Cage, you taking off? Thanks for hanging out. Go play some Overwatch. That sounds fun. Um, I've actually been streaming some of uh, Shadow of War on my personal uh, Twitch channel on uh, twitch.tv slash rankedfile. If anybody wants to hang out, I'll probably be doing some more of that later tonight. All right, so now I've got that yellow tone that we were working with and I'm kind of just going back in and dropping that back into some of the recesses because I want to push those areas back to bright and the, it's very transparent as yellow paints tend to be so uh, it also helps smooth out some of our blends that may not have been perfect before Just sort of dabbing that in any of these little recesses and this is where you got to be really careful trying to get down into the little sort of cracks and dips of the of the mini but if you do this well you get a really nice smooth blend and it really starts standing out and it looks totally gorgeous and makes all these little recesses look really hot like temperature wise I'm not going to go too far up yet because I want to make sure I'm doing this while it's all still wet and I'm moving it closer and closer and closer to white um, and making smaller and smaller and smaller impressions on here. Just kind of dabbing it in and stippling it in. Um, and while it's still wet, that allows me to blend it much smoother. When I'm pulling, remember we're pulling in the direction we want it to be most opaque. Kind of doing it again. Just trying to lay in a little bit of this yellow and white. Actually, I'm going to go jump straight to the white because so I've got enough yellow in my brush already that it's already starting to tint towards that white or towards yellow. And it's so thin down it doesn't stand out much. Doot, 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 doot. saying that stippling is a Sharpie project nightmare. I like stippling. As you may have guessed, I'm the fact that I'm painting tiny miniatures and took four years of animation class, I sort of like tedium. I like art projects that require a lot of concentration and patience. So that might just be me. But stippling tends to work really well. Uh, uh, Hochi Wa was asking, uh, could I use a bright colored wash to catch those interior bits? Um, I'm used to seeing things that uh, washes darken, but fire feels like the opposite. So that's exactly the problem. Um, washes do tend to uh, darken. Um, in order to do this, I would have to use like a white wash or a, like a very bright yellow wash. Um, and that's kind of what I'm doing, but I'm doing it in a super controlled manner. Um, the paint that I'm using is basically glaze consistency, maybe slightly more opaque. Um, washes in general are going to tend to unify your colors uh, and pull everything towards that color and they tend to darken. Um, and I would lose a lot of my cool contrasts and things like that that I've built up if I was trying to use a wash. Um, I'll use a lot of washes um, on 
any number of my other models. Most of the time when I'm painting, <clears throat> and I'm not doing the opposite sort of process where I'm, I'm painting light in the recesses, uh, my process is put down a base coat, put on my first sort of glaze of uh, highlights, and then I'll do a wash, and that's going to pull everything back down. That's going to give me my darkest shadows and things like that, and then I'll start building up my highlights and smooth passes. All right, we're getting real close to done on this side. Add a little bit more white down on the base, where it's going to be the hottest. You can start to see some of the effects. Is that going to focus? Come on. Does that help? There you go. So you can see the effect here. Um, and how this is going to go is this actually... Oh, shoot. This one's too tall. Here, let me take the cap off of this. I can show you on camera. Actually take this out of the clip for a sec. Um, but when this is done, this will actually get glued in and pinned in behind the character so you can see this focuses uh, how that's going to look and these nice bright warm colors are going to contrast really well with the cooler sort of blues and purples of her skin yeah I did uh, okay, I did a lot of graphic design uh, before I went back to school and I could, I could tell you I, I definitely spent a lot of time nudging pixels, pushing pixels here and there and all that kind of stuff. All right, so now we're going to move back towards our yellow and orange, and we're going to lay in our highlights on the opposite side here. Come on. My hands are getting a little bit shaky. I may need to take a break here in a little bit. It's also very important to do when doing this stuff. It requires so much concentration. It's really easy to kind of burn yourself out. I find myself holding my breath a ton. I actually do have some chores and stuff to get done today too. Yeah, the uh, cage says it's gonna look so dope. I am, I am prone to agree. I'm excited about it. I wish I could keep it, keep this one. But like I said, this is an incredibly rare mini that I was just lucky enough to get commissioned to paint. It's the first actual commission project I've ever taken. Before this I was always really hesitant. I'd had a couple people ask if I could paint for them, um, but I didn't really want to turn my hobby into a chore or into something I was doing for money. I wanted to keep it something I did out of enjoyment, but then I came across this project and I'd been pursuing these minis for years, trying to get my hands on them. I only ever had one that I bought at a show back in like 99. And they'd show up on eBay for like 50 to 100 dollars a piece. And like this one would never, ever show up on eBay. It's super, super, super hard to find. So I figured this was going to be the closest opportunity I was ever going to get. to actually owning them. Um, the guy's actually been cool enough to let me make copies of a few of them. Um, I'm not making copies of all of them. Like this this one, I think it's just too complicated to, to get a good mini from. So I'm just going to say goodbye when it's finished. That's already looking, looking good, but I think I need to pull a little more yellow in. It's looking a little too red. Um, so I'm going to wash the brush, try to get some of this white out of it. And we're going to glaze in a little bit of the yellow. And then I think we're probably going to call it. My throat's starting to get a little dry. I need to go make some food and stuff like that. So, Yeah, Cage says that is a big mood, trying to uh, change a, chobby, a hobby into a into a chore. It's, uh, it's important to, to recognize that and it's something that I kind of ended up doing when I got into games, too, is I found that my enjoyment of games changed drastically. 
uh, when I started making games because you start seeing behind the curtain seeing how the sausage is made and I spend more time analyzing games than I do playing them for the enjoyment which isn't to say that there's not great things and a lot of enjoyment I get out of games but my process for it has changed a lot and I was always worried that that would change my enjoyment for model making if I were to do that professionally too. I already find that, especially with the uh, uh, quarantine and working from home all the time, I spend so much time in my computer desk that I have a really hard time sitting down at my computer desk to play games because it just doesn't feel like recreation. It feels like that's where I go to work. So you got to learn to find that balance. And it's important to have hobbies and outlets. Alright, I'm going to call this here for now. Um, I still have to do the other side. I'll do that at another point. But I think that's going to do it. That looks really nice. Um, and you can see like that heat effect. Is that focusing at all? Um, what you always says, uh, that's why my gaming PC is on my TV. See, I've got consoles I've got my uh, uh, I've got a PS4 and a Xbox One and I find that I just don't play them that much um, my spouse really isn't super into watching games necessarily and I find when I'm there I want more shared experience stuff uh, you know we'll watch movies and TV and stuff like that together or Netflix or whatever um, but I don't tend to play a lot of games on the couch. Um, it's, you know, that's a, a shared space. So um, I tend to be more of a PC gamer. Um, that's one of the things I like a lot about the Switch is if I'm hanging out upstairs, I can still be playing games and be present. But uh, I've got my little space downstairs where I can go to sort of retreat and play games. All right, so I'm going to call it here. Um, uh, we'll see you later Cage thanks for hanging out it's always always a pleasure to see you um, actually check your mail soon too you should be getting something in the mail here pretty quick I promise um, and then uh, yeah we'll catch you next time on the next episode of Make It So make sure to, to stick around uh, uh, follow the channel um, the, we've got all kinds of other cool content uh, tomorrow we've got another episode of uh, Jen Vaughn's Big Dungeon show coming up um, um, you can follow me on uh, Twitter, it's at Rank and File, uh, my personal Twitch channel is uh, is uh, twitch.tv slash Rank and File and I've got some previous episodes of Make It So up on my personal YouTube channel um, which is youtube.com slash Rank and File a bunch of our other shows are available also up on the Very Very Spaceships YouTube channel, which is uh, uh, youtube.com slash VBSPA. Um, or maybe VB Spaceship, I don't remember which one, but if you look up VBSPA or VB Spaceship on, on YouTube, you'll find them. Uh, but want to say thanks for hanging out. It's fun talking, and we'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.